Thank you. Round of applause. So event sourcing in Elixir. Uh, so just like a little context, um, I'm very passionate about soccer. I play soccer. I coach soccer since the since my early age. Uh, so and I always use like any kind of like pet project or anything side project to keep learning. Uh, and this was kind of like joining two things that I'd like to do. Uh, this game is just a fantasy. Uh, soccer game is one thing that I created in 2008 uh, when I used to do PHP and I had for some friends to, to, to use that. I used that as a, a playground as well for me to keep learning uh, and I decided, oh, it's time for me to rewrite that in Elixir. Uh, also, the time that I was decided to rewrite the game, I was uh, working with event sourcing in my prior company. Uh, in Ruby, and so I'd like to learn uh, and to see how I would implement this uh, in Elixir. That's a functional programming, uh, and like having a game like you revamped. Um, so what you are uh, gonna see today is a little bit of concept of event sourcing, but I don't want to go too deep because there is lots of talks about event sourcing. There is a lot of materials, but I need to give some context to you guys so you can understand like what the game is about, like what like the decisions that I uh, that I made uh, for the game implementation. Um, you're going to see a lot of co code in Elixir for the main components uh, that implement. So it's not be will not be just a theory. Uh, talk, but we are going to see like some hands-on <coughs> stuff um, and how Elixir helps us to uh, implement event sourcing in general. So you're going to see gen stage, you're going to see gen state machine, gen server, uh, and like acto chain sets, that kind of stuff. So I'm Pedro Sonson. Uh, I work for CityBase uh, as a tech lead, CityBase. Uh, is a GovTech company. Uh, we use Elixir for production since 2017. Uh, and for sure, we are hiring Elixir developers. We also uh, hiring Ruby developers because we have applications in Ruby as well and React developers. So if you are interested, you can talk to me or you can talk with some folks here that they are from CityBase as well. Um, so the agenda that we have today, as I said, some concept about event sourcing, CQRS, um, the game itself, uh, what is the game is about, uh, the command architecture, the query, uh, some main components, and some data. So like how event sourcing translates uh, the data uh, and how data is seen in event sourcing and the benefits for that. And the last part is just like a summary, just see like what is the pain points of implementing uh, event sourcing. What, is, what are the benefits for that? And some resources in general, because these slides will be chair, shared, so you can take a look later. Um, so researchers said that if you have a picture of a cat or a dog, your presentation will go fine. <laughs> this is not my dog. But I love German Shepherd, so, and just in case, let's keep a dog uh, there. And so event sourcing, uh, that's the first concept that we are going to talk. Um, so pretty much event sourcing is a pattern uh, in the domain-driven design. Um, domain-driven design is much more than event sourcing, uh, but event sourcing is one of the ways that you can implement domain-driven design. Uh, it's also used uh, in combination with another parent called CQRS. Uh, they don't need to get to, to be together always, but they get along very well. So it's very common you see system in event sourcing with CQRS alongside. Uh, event sourcing, you have stage changes and they are stored as events and those events are immutable and they are the source of truth of your system, okay? Uh, everything is around events. Uh, that's why event sourcing and not event streaming. Event streaming has events, but they are not supposed to act as source of truth of your business logic. Event sourcing uses that as a source of truth. Event streaming, when you are logging to a third-party API, 
you are event streaming, maybe, uh, but you're not doing event sourcing. When you're using Kafka, doesn't mean that you are doing event sourcing. Uh, they are different concepts. They have events around that, but they are different. Uh, the current state in an event sourcing system is, uh, is what we call projection. And the projection is just like a sequence of events played one by one in order, in order uh, that the event happened. Um, and event sourcing, you can go back in time. Because you are recording event by event, you can simulate what was my projection or my current state for a specific aggregate, let's say a user, two days ago. You can simulate that if this is important for you in your system. You don't need to do that, but you can answer those questions if this is important for your business. Um, and because you have everything that's important recorded as events in a database, you, you have like audit log for free. You, and these are, these are not disconnected. Like sometimes you log a lot of stuff that happens in your system, but you are logging in a way that maybe doesn't mean exact what happened and with different data. So sometimes you export to a log like it, something, and but it's not what was fully recorded, let's say. And with event sourcing, the event itself has everything that you need and the audit log that you have in the database of events has exactly the same data. What is not event sourcing? Uh, it's not a totally new concept at all. Event sourcing is not a technology or computer associated concept. So event sourcing exists like in accounting. So accounting uses event sourcing. They don't delete, they don't modify anything that happened. If you have like a ledger, everything is one by one is just appending. If you need to revert uh, accidental thing, you create a new event and you have that story telling that, oh, this happens, this happened later, but there is no eraser, that is nothing like that. So, mad scene. Uh, so you have like you're a pas uh, your patient, you go to a doctor, all your history of visits are there. They are not, oh, what is my current state today in terms of health? The doctor knows everything about you because that is important for them. It's not about today, it's about all, all your history. Uh, if you go legal, so you have a contract and you need to change the contract like uh, one year later, you don't change the contract, you, uh, you have an addendum that reflects the change that you, you, you want. Um, in terms of like computer, Git. Everybody uses Git or any type of source control, but Git specifically is event sourcing. So you can go back in time, everything that happens is recorded. Like if you Git branch in some specific, you are seeing a projection of all the events that happen. So Git is a very nice example of event sourcing. It's a very successful example of event sourcing. Um, Event sourcing is also not a highly architecture. That means that you don't need to design your entire system with event source. You can have only a small part that is makes sense in event sourcing. You don't need to, oh, my entire application is event sourcing and I'm tied with the pros and cons for everything. So, Food broker, for example, has lots of stuff that they are not event sourced because it doesn't make sense. But the things that are event sourced are the ones that they make sense, they fit that concept. And event sourcing, as I said, is not the same thing as event streaming. Um, just so like a quick terminology, uh, we have aggregate. Aggregate is like a, a unit of business logic. It's like a user is an aggregate. Events can happen on top of a user. A player uh, is an aggregate. A uh, trade is an aggregate. Things can happen on top of that. And the aggregate will hold the business logic. What can happen with that aggregate? And depending on the, the events that already happened with that aggregate, the business logic will decide this can, go, this can happen or not. Okay, for example, if a user is registered, he cannot register again because, and the system can control, hey, we already have a uh, user registry event 
for that same aggregate. You cannot do twice if, the, if your business decides like that. But the event itself uh, represents the state change. Uh, the event handler listens to events that happen and do the follow-up with the projection. The projector is the one that knows what needs to be done, what I need to update in my projection. In my projection, sorry. So, for example, if I am, uh, let's say, in the game, you can be, you have an amount, and you can buy players, and you can sell players, and when a transaction happens, the user will be credited or debited. Uh, when one of these two events happen, the account balance of the user that's the current state needs to be updated. There is a logic there. What needs to be, what needs to happen in the projection when user credit happen? I need to sum with the current balance, with the new balance, and so on. So the projector will know based on each event what is the calculation that needs to be done. It can be simple calculation, can be complex calculation. It depends your system. And the projection itself is the current state, is what the user is seeing, what the UI is reading. Okay? And is the reflection is the uh, is the product of many events being played in order. So let's say an example real quick. Um, so let's say that I have like an e-commerce and I have two events. I didn't added and I didn't removed. Okay, and this if each event has some data. Uh, what is important on this event in that specific case is each event has a unique identifier, has a date, always refers to one aggregate, has an aggregate ID, uh, and has an event data. The event data will vary based what that event's about. So if the if I'm doing like the adding added, I have the product ID that I'm adding and the quantity. Just to keep simple, another event happened, another item was added. Same situation. The user decides to remove an item. Now the event data is a slight different content because that's what matters for that specific event. Another item was added, and if you take a look, the shopping cart, the shopping cart is just like the projection, it's just the, after these four events, this is the current state of my application. But the shopping cart was evolving after each one of these events for the system. So your shopping cart is just like the way that the business understands the product of these two types of events in e-commerce. But the event sourcing will give you to, the opportunity to keep in the same events that we have in the system. I can have different projections. I can have a projection that just tell me, because it's important for the business, that I can have like a list of removed items. So, and this can happen even after the events were were there, like the events could be there one year ago, and the business had a great idea. Oh, what if we knew if, how the people is removing items? And instead of like having this new logic in place, and you only will collect data after you deploy, you automatically has an you automatically have a new projection with a lot of data already because you just need to replay those events and make the calculation. So this is fantastic in terms of business because it gives you flexibility. You don't need to think about everything that can happen. You don't need to over-engineer in your system because, oh, probably we will need that feature. Probably I need to keep recording this or probably whatever. So the system can evolve uh, in a very, in a more natural way. So just to summarize, uh, events are never deleted or updated. Uh, event sourcing will tell a story based on the sequence of events stored that we have. And the current state is transient. That means that 
anytime your system, if it's designed using event sourcing and well designed, you could dump, you could delete your projection and replay all the events and the projection should be exactly the same. Okay? Or if you have, I have my projection that used by, the, my, by my website, whatever, I can take the, those events and project in, uh, in memory place because I want to do reporting or whatever, another thing. I can project, as long as those events are there, I can start like planning the projection the way that I decide to. One of the simple ways is there for the UI, but doesn't mean that it's only for the UI. Cool. The, the other pattern that I mentioned is CQRS. Uh, and CQRS is a pattern uh, that came before uh, event sourcing um, and can be used like standalone as well. And you have two concerns one, commands, and the other one are queries. So the commands are intents to modify state. Okay? and your function will be only doing that thing. That function will be responsible for, oh, my intent is modifying state. Uh, and the queries will not modify state, you only read state. You only read the current state. Uh, as I mentioned, SecureS is different concept, but works really nice together. Another set of terminology, because we are gonna see these names together with the event source terminology plus the CQRS. So you have the command. The command is just like a request. I want to do something. It's always a verb. Register user, credit user, by player. Like is a is an intent to modify state. You have the command handler. The command handler will check if the command is valid in terms of the data has all the required fields that has to be present, the, the data type is correct, the length, or if it's a password, has their minimum requirements, all that kind of stuff. Does the pre-validation. It's not about the business logic yet, it's just about like, this has the minimum requirement to be moving forward to the aggregate or not. We have the repository, the repository, it's like any database repository. It's just like a layer that you connect with the database and the database can be a write or read only. And the query itself is the reading piece of that. It's just like I'm reading from the read database. Just to um, illustrate that. So let's see the command model. We have a user interface <laughs> We have the command model that includes the command itself and check the validations and the aggregate with the business logic. I have my database with the writes, all the changes event by event, and I have my event handler. The event handler, when the, when the event happened, the event handler will be responsible to tell the world, hey, this event just happened. Do something. Update my projection. Do something. Okay. The query model is very simple. It's just the user interface that has some API that reads from the database that's available, that's uh, responsible for the projection itself. Uh, the good thing is that you have situations that the event is the same, but you want to approach that in a different way. So Sometimes you have a new product in your catalog and you, you need to update the, the main database with that new product, but you also want to update the search database with this new thing. And the search database is a totally different database in terms of like technology. So the event handler will know, hey, I need to, because of this event, I need to update in two places. I need to project this in two different ways because my business or my system understand that this is important. And this can be a cache, this can be anything that you can rely on. Cool. Uh, so concept, um, 
aside, let's take a look in the example, uh, Foot Broker. So Foot Broker is a fantasy game uh, that combines real football, that I call football, you guys call soccer, uh, with stock market. So the idea is that instead of like, I can go to a stock exchange and buy stocks from Apple or Microsoft or SAP, whatever, the stock is about the player. Okay, so I can buy Ibrahimovic, I can buy Wayne Rooney, I can buy a stock of a player. Uh, but the purchase, the transaction happens exactly the same as a stock market. I can buy from you, you can buy from me. I, if I have that in my portfolio, I can offer to sell, I can set my price. You can, you can put a buy order saying, oh, I want to buy this player, this quantity, with this price. If, I, if you don't have any seller agreeing on that, the transaction will not happen, but the order is still there until another seller goes, oh, I agree with your terms and I want to transact with you. Uh, the player price is exactly the same as happens in the market. It's not stipulated by the company. It's stipulated by the market itself. Like, depending the, how the company is doing, people will be willing to buy or will be willing to sell. And these prices will drop or prices will go up. It's very natural. Um, of course, the market itself has some like regulations. And the game also has some logic to avoid uh, fraud, to avoid overpricing, to avoid underpricing. This is all business logic inside the game. And doing analogy with the, co the companies and the stock market, when you have a, like a quarter financial report from Apple saying the profit that they have or the new release of iPhone and that kind of stuff, and it makes the market to willing to buy that stock, what happens at Foot Broker is that the player stats in real life contributes with dividends or losses. So you have that aspect as this is the thing that associates the fantasy with the, the real world. Uh, just a couple of, of screens. Um, we have like a stock market, you can search for club for player name you can see what players uh, have like open orders or sell orders you can see player details you can see some price changes you can see some stats it's trying to give you some information uh, so you can take some decisions try to see what is being offered what is being uh, available uh, for for you to sell but the it's very simple concept you have like you sign up, you, you have like some fictitious uh, money, you can start like buying players if people are willing to sell. You, you're gonna get some profit or losses, uh, whatever. You can decide when you wanna sell, when you wanna buy, and so on. So, cool, but why I decide to use event sourcing for this specific case? So this is a this is a side project. I could use anything like that I decide to. So one, uh, I think the business model, this transaction trade, this um, price change, this variation has a lot uh, in terms of good fit for event sourcing. Um, I'd like to also, because I had experience to implement that uh, in Ruby in the past, I'd like, oh, I love Elixir and I know how functional programming would be helpful in terms of event sourcing, in terms of like how replaying an event is just like a, a function that folds event by event to the new state. In Ruby, you don't have that. You need to mimic that behavior. In functional programming, that's much more natural. Um, and for sure, increase my event sourcing experience overall. Uh, I would like to I like that thing, and I'd like to, oh, let's see if what people say about it is true, is not true, is half true. I, I want to try myself and get my experience on that. And if it's applicable in my professional uh, needs, great. At least will give me, A, I know how to implement this in event sourcing, and maybe some system that I'm developing at, uh, at my work can be useful, maybe not. Maybe if someone, hey, 
let's do event sourcing for that specific use case. I can say, hey, my experience says that this is not a good fit. You know, so at least gives you a growth in terms of um, professional knowledge. The other question is why I'm not using a library. <coughs> so just, in, just uh, for the sake of clarity, uh, I build everything from scratch. Uh, and I could have like some library being used to speed up my development. But that was not my goal. My goal was um, I want to learn. If I take a library, probably that learning will be affected. I didn't have a deadline. This is my, this is my thing. So I don't need to rush in terms of like speed up the process, get deployed as soon as I can. I have a deadline for a client, whatever. So I was, I was more comfortable with that. I wouldn't like to take architecture decisions too early. So the library, when you are taking a library using any dependency and this applies to anything, you're kind of like it tied with that thing. Like the decisions that were made, you're kind of agreeing, hey, you're giving me this, I pay that price. Uh, and that applies to anything. <clears throat> and event sourcing Elixir is still new. So if you look for libraries like Commanded or Maestro, they are kind of halfway. And I tried to see if there was something that I could work together uh, with those libraries and start like contributing, but was not aligned what, what, what I was willing to do. And so it didn't make sense uh, for me to, to use a library. <coughs> but I understand that not everybody will have the same situation, but it's good. Uh, thing to say. So let's try to see now how the system works and the main components. Uh, so I'll try to go one by one with what they mean and try to see some code and see if you can like move forward and, and understand better. So the first thing is and the more uh, and the more complex is the command. Everything that's gonna try to write things. The read part is simple. It's just like a read projection and that's it. Uh, so the commands can become very complex if your system uh, needs. So first thing we have an API and that's pretty simple. Um, the API pretty much sends a command to a command gen stage. Okay. In that part the command is validated. Does that pre-check? Does has all the required fields? If if that is not returns to the, the API, the API will present the chance, the actor chance set, validation errors, and move on, as like any other system. But this is a task of the command gen stage. Um, some examples of command, like for the user aggregate, I can register a user, I can add a player to the portfolio, I can create a user, uh, I can set a player price, I can cancel a buy order, I can add a buy order, I can complete a sell order. All these are intents to modify the current state. And all of them, they require some data. I think we can see, yeah, cool. Um, so pretty much the commands are simple embedded schemas. They are just like a data structure with validation. They are not tied with tables or database or whatever. It's just like Acto schema and chain set to do some pre-checks. Uh, each command will have your set of data and your validations can become super complex. Uh, here I have some of them, it's just for the sake of uh, use case, but can become anything. Anything that your business, oh, this command is only valid with those constraints, you can add those. Of course, there is no database constraint. It's just like data validation. So the next step. So let's say that everything goes fine and the command uh, is valid. So the next step is the, to the aggregate. The aggregate is the thing that holds the business logic. Assuming that command is valid, doesn't mean that the command will move forward and you create an event. For example, uh, let's say that the user uh, is trying to register twice. 
the system will have an event for that same aggregate that already happened. So the aggregate will use the event sourcing, the, the event store, to look for existing events for that same aggregate and can reject uh, that command. If everything goes fine, we move forward. So the user aggregate is just a gen server. Um, and of course, there is a lot of code being removed here for, for the sake of clarity. And so we can put everything in one single slide, but has an API like register, okay? That has uh, the command and has the handle call. If you see after the handle call, we have two business logic that we need to validate when the user is trying to register. First, if we check again if the command is valid, and you're going to understand that later, uh, why I'm doing that again if my command handler uh, already did that before. The other is if it is a new user, if it's true that, and that logic, of course, is a private function that reads from the event, the event store and determines if it's true or false, and the uniqueness is in the email in that sense, the aggregate builds the event for that specific action, in this case, the user register. So the event that is important here is all of this is the event data that is important for that specific event. Each event will have different event data, okay? The business understands that this is the minimum information that I need to have. Of course, part of that event data is required for all the events. Aggregate ID, the version. Later, when the event is persisted, we have the event ID, and we also have the event date. We don't have that in now because this is not being appended yet. Uh, the version is being used for race condition. So let's say that I have two commands, okay, that they can happen uh, many times, but you have stale data. Only one will pass because the next one, the next command will tell, hey, I'm trying to do th this thing on top of the version five. And if I have the same command doing the same thing on top of the version five for the same aggregate, the second command will be rejected because the context doesn't apply anymore. You have stale data, okay? We, we will see something similar later. Uh, but the idea is that um, the aggregate will do business logic validation that can become super complex depending on what you are doing. We'll build the event data and you tell the event store, hey, append this event. The next step, the event store that was called by the aggregate after. So the event store is uh, just an actor repo. Uh, in my case here, I use Postgres to store both events and bo or, or projections. So I have two repos and I have two Postgres databases. Uh, there are databases that they are specific for event store, for event sourcing. They have features that allows you to, they, they have the concept of event sourcing very uh, in the root. So they have like some features that they help replaying events, they help with things very specific to event sourcing, but I'm not using those. Um, so the task of the event store is first, Persist the event, of course. And the other one is tell to the event handler, that's an event stage, a new event happened. Okay? The event itself is an active schema, but now it's associated with a database. It's not embedded. It's, so there is a user stable that holds all events for all user aggregates. How many events for the user we have? In the game, we have like five events, okay? But user register is just one of them. Uh, and you're gonna have like event ID, event type, 
that is the user register, user this, user that, uh, the aggregate ID, the event date, the version, and the event data. The event data is that one that's specific for each event type. And everything is required, uh, pretty much. Uh, the version, I already mentioned that. Uh, so the event store, the append event um, takes that, uh, adds the event ID and the event data, and just like write to the database and sends back a message to the API, hey, I just record that event. So when the API receives a message from the event store saying the event's recorded, the API can say, okay, is everything worked in the command side, okay? Everything that happens in the projection side is an eventually consistent piece, okay? As long as the event store has the event, even if the projection fails, I can replay that later and sync the projection. So that is, that's something that you need to consider that your system in event sourcing is eventually consistent. So the UI will read something that can be outdated for a period of time. And you need to have like it, uh, functions in place to resync the projection if you need and of course you have to have monitoring to know when do I need to resync you need to have a strategy to fix eventually failures if you need to to fix those but monitoring and alerts and fixing data is something that you need to have it doesn't matter the system that you have it's not an event sourcing problem if you are doing like a, a, a no event sourcing system and something breaks, and something fails to write, you need to know what needs to be done. Like you just need to, hey, just ignore. It was just an, an, uh, an exception and I don't know what happens with the data. The data consistency is always important, doesn't matter. It's not an event sourcing thing. Next step, the event stage. <coughs> Based on each event, so the event stage, uh, let's say it receives a user event, knows, hey, if it's a user event, I need to talk with the projector. The projector has the calculations, this change of state in my projection. So the projector knows what needs to be done in terms of projection based on the event that just happened. So the event stage here, uh, the event handler is just a gen stage that subscribes to event user producer or event player producer, whatever. And in this case, uh, the handle event is a gen stage uh, callback that handles the back pressure and handles the event. And event by event, I call the projectors for the user and they project this. The event handler doesn't need to know exactly what is the calculation that's being done, just delegates that. It's just like a, a, a broadcaster. The projector then has the responsibility to update the projection store. That's another database. Uh, so if you take a look in a projection for the user, we had the projection for, we have the, the user events, it's very standard, doesn't matter the event that we have, but the projection of the user is the thing that your UI is concerned about. So, and all the things that the UI is concerned about was generated by those events that we have and being modified by that. So when the user register, for example, uh, we collect the email, first name, last name, that thing. But the balancing sense is not part of the user registration event. It's part of like another event that listens to the user registration and credits the initial balance. There is a separation of concerns here. But for the projection, the projection doesn't know that. The project, the UI only, oh, I need to read this projection. These are the things that I have available to me to read and to present, but that projection doesn't mean that was only updated by 
user events or not. And here, um, one thing to, to consider is that because my projections, they use data that came from the events, I don't need to be super constrained in terms of validation. My validation, my, the importance of my data consistency happens in my event store. The projection you can lose in terms of validation because you don't need to do everything again. You're, you need to consider that the event store has a source of truth and a source of consistency and source of like validation. The projection is just like a current state. Kind of like I trust in the data that came from the event store. And you can see that the version, um, the version is recorded as part of the projection because this version is being used for the new command, for the next command for the same aggregate. And the event ID records in the projection what was the last event that changed that projection. So this also helps to see if my projection is in sync or out of sync with my event store. So the projector here for the user um, registration, because the projection starts when the user register is the first event, uh, you need to build the projection. So this is the initial of that projection. I'm not updating a projection, I'm creating the first row for that aggregate. So that's what happened when the event type is the user register. So the projector here, of course, I don't have all the handle calls. This projector will handle call each event for the user. Handle the user register, handles the user credit, handle user password changed, handle user requested passwords changed. All those events are handled by each handle call projector. And depending on each event, something will happen that will be different from each other. That's the case here. Uh, so it's the same projector, but now I'm handling different events. So in this case here, I'm, a, I'm projecting the first one, I'm projecting a account balance update. Doesn't matter if it's credit or debit, I just need to sum the current with the new one that just came for the event from the event. Uh, the other one is when the user changes the password. I just need to replace the hashed password with the password that was just changed. So all the other things I don't need to care about. The only thing that I care about in the first one is the balance and the date that was updated, the new version, and the event ID. But in terms of logic, it's just the balancing sense. The second one, the only thing that matters is the new password hashed. But all the other ones are just for sync um, intentions. This is the, with no edge cases, you have that situation. But what happens if, oh, when I, when I register, the user will be credit, okay, right? Because he needs to have some money to start like buying stuff. And also the user will send an email, welcome email. So from one event, I have projection updates, I have a new command, and then I have like external call to a third party email system, whatever. And this can be anything, okay? Just like one example. So when you have situations like that, and your logic will tell that, like this is how, this, how the business wants the system to work. It's kind of like we are talking the same language. You don't need any translation. I'm not, I'm not talking about classes. I'm not talking about like modules. I'm not talking about like behavior. I'm talking like hey, the business understands when the user register, I want this and I want that. So I need to have commands for those actions. And I have to have something that can address that in a better better way. So that what happens uh, with the process manager. Process manager is just like a name. 
Uh, you can use like sagas as pattern, something that you have like a multi-step thing, and you can use anything to control these multi-steps, but you know that you have one thing that happened and more than one thing as a reaction, okay? So this is controlled, what I call the process manager. And the process manager, uh, they are gen state machine, it's pretty much a, a state machine that has all these steps and knows what needs to do next. Some of these reactions, they are, oh, only after the first, I will trigger the second. Some of them, they are, I don't care. I can credit the user and the email, they are super separate concerns. I don't need to wait to credit and later send an email welcoming the user. But sometimes you have this, oh, I need two steps, but the second only can happen after I know that the first one was successful. So the other things that can happen is that one event happened and more than one projection needs to be updated. Okay, let's say that the price of a player changed. I need to update the player projection with the new price, but I also have another projection with all the price changes, all the market fluctuation. So I need to update both plays because for the game, this is important and the stakeholders decide that this should be done. So how to control this kind of like side effects. So the process manager can update another projection and can restart with a new command. So if we take a look and compare the event handler before with this one, it's the same event handler, but what's being highlighted is A, for each event, I want to update the user projection. Okay, it doesn't matter what event I have. And maybe I will run the, the process manager because I only will run the process manager if the event type is user register. Okay, if the event type is user register, besides the normal projection update, I will delegate to the process manager to control the extra side effects that I have. So the process manager has the same name of the event, just for clarity. Um, and is a gen state machine. You can take a look how gen state machine works in terms of like a gen state machine, but it's a state machine. It's a concept that is outside Elixir Erlang. So you can have multi-step and the gen state here, you can have steps that they are triggered by outside Let's say that you have like a, a different command that sends a message to a state machine and because of that message, they start the step. Or you can have like totally internal um, triggers. So in this case, as I mentioned, uh, the welcoming email is not associated with the credit user. So I can trigger the credit user once I, 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 I did the credit user command based with the information of that event, I can trigger the next step automatically. I don't need to wait for the credit user being done to start the welcome email process. And so it spawns concurrent process uh, here. And I can control. And of course, in a process manager like this, as any concurrence aspect, I need to be careful I need to be aware that if something happens bad, what I need to do. So there is a lot of log, there is a lot of like metrics in place to detect if I need, if I need, oh, if I welcome emails fail because of my third party email delivery, what should I do? Is this important to, what cannot happen is sent twice, but if, the, if it fails, if it sends like 10 minutes later, is, is critical for the system or kind of okay. It depends. So it's never like one solution for everything, but you need to be careful in terms of like how you control that.
the query architecture is super simple. You have a read-only API on that reads the projection store from the projection, and that's it. There is no uh, thing uh, in terms of complexity. And this projection doesn't need to be one-on-one -on -one pair with the events. You don't need to be one projection for one for user aggregate. You can have many projections for user aggregate. If your business understands that, oh, there are one specific event in the user aggregate that I would like to collect and show in a different way. The price change for a player is one example of that. So all good, um, but let's see how data is, uh, is structured. So you can have an idea. So this is like, uh, this is the events uh, for the user. And here I'm selecting all the events for a specific aggregate. So you can see that I have all the event types. I know exactly what happened with this user, the dates, everything. And I have all the event data telling me what, what was being recorded in terms of data. Um, what is being sent by the commands. Um, so this is kind of like the free audit log for a specific user. And I can have that for anything. I can, I can have all the historical piece by piece of my user activity in that case. But this can happen with any aggregate, okay? It's kind of like telling a story about everything. This is the user projection. In a projection, my aggregate was this, is the same user, uh, has only one row per aggregate. And this is the current state after all those events that we saw, okay? But if for any reason I wanna see what, is, what was the current state of the same user one week ago, I can do that. You just replaying the three force events, okay? Portfolio is another aggregate, okay? But is what we call, uh, you have the portfolio events, like when a player is added to your portfolio or removed from your portfolio. So the portfolio standalone doesn't make sense. The portfolio always belong to the user. So that's why we have a term called aggregate root in event sourcing. That means the user is the aggregate root for the portfolio because the portfolio itself doesn't make sense. So here I'm checking, giving me all the portfolio events, everything that was added and removed in the portfolio investments for that same user that we saw. So the portfolio was set, some player was added and you have all the event data there and some player was removed, something happened with that. That's why we have the user events credit and debit because it was buying a player and was selling a player. All this reflects on those uh, data changes. In the portfolio projection is, this is the investments for that user now, after those three events. The player events, so we have a specific player, the player was created, he had like a three price change, so the player price was set three times. This happens when someone bought or sold, transacted that player, and the, pre and the price was changed, so had a price variation. So these are the events, um, and you're gonna see that the projection has the last one of them, but in all the information in terms of like, what's the club ID that this player is, all the country ID that this player was born, the birthday, the position, the font URL, if is the player is active or not. Uh, all of that is to fulfill, the projection is to fulfill navigation UI concerns. Uh, all the price activity is related to transaction. Uh, so all of that is around the player. And when the player price set event happened, the only thing that changes is the price in sense updates. 
with a new price. All the other things doesn't doesn't change at all. A buy order is when someone, oh, I want to buy a player. So the buy order events, like same thing. You have like a buy order added, a buy order completed. Completed when another sell order was added, they match the value, the transaction happened. And here is the projection, the current state after those two events. So you always have this ability to, I, I know all the history of every aggregate ID, and my UI is reading the current state. And if my business or for any other intent besides my UI that's always reading the current state, the most updated, we state, I can do things with the events based on time frame as well to see how was the market time ago. It's not for free. You need to build the functions to do that. But the event handler is the same. The commands are the same. The events are there. The event handler is there. It's just like when, where I want to do the projection. I, I can build something that with the events, delegates to the event handler, but projects in memory. That's pretty simple to do. Uh, just to summarize um, drawbacks. So what is painful? So first, it's a different design mindset and everything that you need to learn that's new has a learning curve. You, 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 are get, you get lost. You don't know, oh, I'm going to the right path. I'm not going to the right path. This is a, this is a negative thing. Uh, it takes your time. The system in general is much more complex. You have much more moving pieces. You have this component. You need to think more outside of the box. You need to be careful in terms of consistency. Your UI needs to know that maybe this data is stale. How I can present to the user something that tells that if the data is stale. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but if you go to any stock exchange, you're going to see last updated 15 minutes ago because you need to tell that those pri the price of the stock is not like it real time because the projection that they have is not updated. And, but that's you need to tell the user sometimes that, hey, this is a stale data. So there is no problem with you having uh, eventually consistency as long as this is clear for the user and your business is aware and for them is okay. Sometimes it's not okay. So maybe this is something to consider. And it's not a mainstream concept. So you have less tools, less libraries, less framework, or at least a solid framework. So it's different than, oh, I want to do a web framework in Elixir. Oh, uh, I want to do a web application in Elixir. You kind of have some building blocks already done for you. It's not doesn't happen today with event sourcing. Uh, but has some benefits. Uh, so domain-driven design in general is really good. Uh, so the communication between the technical side with the business is with no translation. You are talking about resting your user exactly the same way that the business understands like what's happening. Like the conversation is around actions, intent, and events, facts that happen. So the dialogue is much simpler. Like there is no module, app, or whatever, or we need to split this and that, behavior, whatever, or this will be a gen server or not. We are talking to understand what the business wants is the same thing that we need to translate for the components that we have. There is a nice separation uh, between business logic, data structures. You separate, like you have the commands that you handle with the data. They are very separate with the logic that will just check the data and see if that can happen or not. So that's really nice. Uh, you can do optimization for reading. So your, your, your UI is not constrained with the same database that you use for everything. You can have like optimization in terms of searching, cache, whatever, because 
you need to be you need to have like a solid persistence layer for the events but the projection it depends you don't need to be that restricted you can have a different technology you can use a different thing for projections than the event store uh, the event store and that gives you some flexibility that sometimes is really important future projections can be created based on existing events like you don't need to decide the things that are important for you today uh, and your business can uh, you can understand oh this should be cool if you have that for the user as long as your events they have that data you can present that in many places um, some resource uh, the game itself is available in production of course in a beta state so it's not advertised to anybody but you can go you can create an account you can see how it works you can you can see if you oh this is an, it's a good experience in terms of an application with event sourcing uh, the eventually consistent part of that you can try it out you can see oh I'm bothered by this situation or not oh I didn't feel that it was eventually consistent at all um, Greg Young talk he Greg Young is, is the reference guy for event sourcing in general uh, he wrote a lot of stuff. His talks are nice, uh, very like uh, funny, uh, and he also developed a database for Event Store, uh, Event Sourcing called Event Store, that has these capabilities and his mindset for uh, snapshots for of events. So you can have like micro projections on top of your events. So you, when you read and you need to replace something, you don't need to read everything again. You have like uh, snapshots on that that's very specific uh, the domain domain driven design book in terms of domain driven design is the Bible for that and that's helpful for event sourcing or not knowing about the domain driven design is really cool and there's another book after Eric Evans book implementing domain driven design with more like practical things the first one is more theory the next the the, the latter uh, the later one is more Practical. All right. Uh, seems that I survived. Um, questions? So let's say you're writing state essentially as your events are played, yep. and a business requirement comes in that essentially changes some of the logic you need to do from point B moving forward. Do you have to keep around the, um, the event handler yep. from version one in yes. order to play back for that portion? Yes. yes. Okay. So essentially you have versions yeah. within your names? Yeah. You can you can think about like versioning, and this is a very, uh, that's a great question. Uh, the question was about like how I handle like the, uh, event data changes or versioning. Um, so first, um, you need to ask your, the question is, is this the same event with just like one or two attributes? Uh, let's say the user registration, and now I will collect also the phone. Okay? Uh, so my command will change. <coughs> Sometimes there's a, oh, this, yeah, it's the same process. Okay, cool. The other question is, or this is a totally different thing, and actually it's a different event. It's not a version of that. It's just like, hey, actually we are talking about things, and maybe you are sunsetting the way that we do this action, and we are having another one. But in both ways, uh, if you are adding new things, your event handler would be easy for two. You're keeping the same event, only checking if you have the other data in project, that's okay. If you are like crossing and oh, we are gonna remove two things and add four more, actually you have a different event, but your event handler in that case you need to keep because you need to be able to, if the projection is like totally down, you need to be able to replace the previous event that has four fields and also the new events. So you need to keep that. Good question. Uh, how, like, is it safe to assume that when you're talking about like projections, you always have to be able to date with the events on which you have something that like, something checking or constantly like projecting? In my experience with the game, of course, my game doesn't have lots of traffic. I never had to sync projections. 
I had the functions because I need to test, because I consider that that ability is essential because you cannot say, oh, you can go back in time, you can replay events, and does your system does that? I know. So you, you kind of like you're like using that as an excuse to apply event sourcing, but you're not having the work to do, and when you need to, to do that, you, you kind of don't have. So yes, uh, you need to put monitoring in place just for the sake of monitoring at all, event sourcing or not, and you should consider that, hey, I need to be able to replay events, <coughs> and I need, to be, I need to have a way to know, hey, my projection is out of sync in two events. And this, I, I, I have that. <coughs> um, so this seems like you would run into some friction with a lot of data Would you, based on your past experience with this model, recommend Avoiding use cases where you have a substantial amount of data growth, or would you recommend like a roll up model where periodically you form a new canonical group object and then stack subsequent events? You can. Um, as far as I read and as far as I trust some people, they, they, they don't do that. Like, try to work like, and that. That's, a, that's associated with diversioning as well. Like if those change of requirements, they will happen. Like we cannot guarantee that user registration will be always the same for the lifetime of the application. Uh, the idea is try to mimic the behavior, like what happened in reality, and don't try to put too much like in concepts around that. So what is happening? Is a uh, event change or is a new event? Like if you treat like that, and keep the event handler being able to replay those events, I think you're safe. Of course, you can have edge cases, but I, I didn't have the experience, I didn't have those situations, so I cannot tell, like, hey, I, I decided to buy this path or not, because whatever. It looked like uh, <clears throat> you had a version number per aggregate? Per aggregate ID. So how are you generating those version numbers? Oh, what are concerned? Yeah, there's a fun, the, the command reads from the Y. The, the projection has the version. The, the projection has the the version, the current version, yeah. in the last event ID. And the command from the UI will use that version to pass A, I'm trying to update, I'm trying to do something and this aggregates the version four. And this is passed by the command. That's why I can block any duplication of commands with the same data because they are one of them will be stable. Okay, so if a new command comes in before the projection updates it, will be no matter like that, it will be rejected. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do we even care about um, saving what's coming on the projections? It seems like you've got a bunch of state machines interact with one another, and if after some type of uh, transformation um, on given data uh, happens, uh, why not store the state that was created on the data itself and then persist as opposed to uh, uh, persisting some projection? I, don't know, I, I feel like I'm a bit confused about uh, mm -hmm. keeping track of all those versions. It, it, it would make the organization have to be very timid with uh, change. Uh, you mean, so the events, you have a history, <coughs> and yeah. only piece by piece. The projection only has the last update, and the last version, and the last event ID, and the last data. So the projection only has one row per aggregate. The event, you have all the events for the same aggregate. So if you have a user, and seven events happen for that user, you have seven roles in the event store and only one projection. And one one the projection, that's the last one. Oh, okay. so, so I, I believe that the, uh, the projection is actually what's most important. What yes, the projection happen? is the most important for yeah. the UI, is the one that the UI is reading. For the business or for who is auditing the system, Audit. the event store is the thing that they care about. Like, so you kind of like have both so, it's, 
It's all the same components as event streaming, they just happen in a different order, essentially. What components? Like uh, running through the projections and the event handlers, and then the first thing it hits is the event store as opposed to event streaming, which would be, yes. okay, oh, yeah, updating yeah, yeah. state, yeah. and then after that, it goes into the yes. first. First, the, the event store may call, make sure that the projection, uh, the event is persistent. Yeah. Later, we uh, broadcast yeah. to the event handler gen station. Uh, <coughs> right. Right. I didn't quite understand the um, the eventual consistency problem. If the events are played, or the event, like broadly, is played all the way through into the store. Projected, put in the projection store, and the UI pulls by making a query from the projection store. Doesn't the UI always get the most recent version of the data or the most up to date version? It's because yeah. So in the when you when you when you say hey event store append that event after it is appended, we send a message we send a message to the API saying uh, event was recorded. That time that the API receives that message and says the user registration success or whatever, maybe the projection that has a user is not updated yet. Oh, okay. That's the eventual consistent. We don't wait for, we don't wait, hey, write in the database, wait for the projection, sure. the projection send a message to, to, to <coughs> somewhere saying, I'm okay, or the API waits for two messages, so there is no strong consistency on that aspect. So as as long as the event store has the event, the system is satisfied with, uh, I can move on. Sure, and so as long as the UI users generally understand that there's some sort of asynchrony going on in the system, yeah. then they're aware or if there's uh, some kind of um, yes. web sockets pushing to the UI to yeah. let them know when Perfect. the consistency. Perfect. One e one example is like when the user registered, we we have the email being sent and the credit user command being spawned. The user may see a balance of zero in the beginning and right after change to one hundred okay. when the command like synced okay. when the projection synced. Okay. So that's the eventually consistent aspect. In some situations, this is okay. In other situations, you are not okay. So you need to put like some strong consistency. You cannot tell the API yet until you have a response from the projection that was good. Okay, thank you. Did you, uh, I know that you mentioned that uh, you wrote all the code yourself mm -hmm. and use a particular library. Uh, and also, in event sourcing, there is this issue of uh, Snapchat. Yeah. Uh, where you will have to maintain a Snapchat is when the system crashed down, you replay mm -hmm. those events you know, to a particular Snapchat. Uh, did you implement the that? Uh, no. Challenging? No, no. Uh, I decided to go with Postgres for simplicity and for knowledge. And because Event Store, um, in terms of <coughs> adapters with Elixir and stuff, is not like fully baked. So I would go, oh, okay, I need to wait something, or I, I'm not sure, and something could fail, and I don't know if it was the database that I was relying on. And in my situation, that was okay. You know, so I you like... Think it, you will replay all the events uh, when the system starts? No, I, don't, I, do, I do not do that. Okay. So the projection is persistence, like okay. durable. Okay. The event store is durable. I don't need to, like, there is no, like, if the system goes down and back, <coughs> the external resource, that the post, the two Postgres database, they are there, and they, I don't need to replay anything. Right. Um, I'm, I might have missed it if you had an example. Sorry, but um, how do you deal with validations in the case that a command is no longer valid? The user interface gives the opportunity to submit a command because it was valid at the time the user interface was rendered, but then when I submit it, more events are played on the log, and the command cannot be applied at this time. How do I communicate that back to the user? How do I even tell the user that we don't know if that worked, and we'll tell you in a minute? 
how do I know when I've told them whether or not? Yeah, you, so if the API receives a, a message from the event store, everything was okay. If it receives a, if it receives a command message with change set validations, the command, uh, the API will know and can display the errors for the user. So you validate the command payload synchronously? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if the command is invalid or the business logic doesn't allow the command to move forward, not because of data, because business logic, yeah. the API will be notified lightly with change sets. Exactly. So what if the command can't move forward for data reasons? The email's already been taken by another. Yeah, yeah. That's that's like the command has the email and the email has all uh, it's a valid email in terms of like it rejects, <coughs> let's say, but the user was already that email is already taken. So the command in terms of its data structure is perfect, but today that command is invalid. Time ago was not. So how does the user, how, does, how do you communicate that to the user that their email is already taken? In the, in the aggregate. The aggregate views that logic. Okay. So, so that's still synchronous, is part of your question? Yeah, yeah. is that still synchronous? Ah, it is, it is. Okay. Not, it's not synchronous because when you, when, you, when you throw the message to the gen stage and the API sends the message to the gen stage and waits for a message <coughs> back. This message back can be a successful from the event store or it can be an error from the aggregate. So in theory I could have like a spinner on my user interface yes, you can have like here back yeah, you can have that. Yeah, you can have, or you can have like a, you can, you can have that, yeah. I could let the user know that we're we're trying, but we're not sure yet. Yeah, you can tr you can try you can try the game. Create a user with your name, and create another user with your name, and you're gonna see the experience of like a successful command, and a su successful command with in terms of data, but rejected by the business logic because the email was already taken. Right. You can t you can test that, and you're gonna see the how the how the same. Uh. So what does what does your API look like? Are you just like is it like RESTful like from it, or is it just like events that you're sending in? No, it's it's script. Okay. <coughs> it's like user slash host to users taking the thing. Yep. The only thing that's not crud in sense of it's not crud because there is no create. So you have the user controller, and the user controller has actions like register. Okay. Based on that, so it's not crud in the sense that there is no rest mm -hmm. like index show that like Rails crud type of thing. Is rest in the transport? It's not, uh, but it's not rest in the controller actions. The controller actions they mimic the intent of the commands, kind of like command driven. You you read as a command. Do you want to need to need to substantially rethink how you handle associations between data and the small lock? You're kind of envision scenarios where you care about the aggregate ID and the version in one direction or another, or something like that. Yeah, we have. I have situations like that, but this event cannot happen if it's not after or cannot happen before. So, and that's business logic, like some actions, like you cannot credit the user why the user was not present. That is, that is not, that's not make sense. You cannot add, add a play in the portfolio if the portfolio was not set for a user that was not created. So it, it is all reflect, yeah, that makes sense as the game should work. You know, you have those rules and those rules just translate to events and commands. They don't need to be too mystic, too tacky, you know, in that sense. So I, that's the domain-driven design. It's like it, everything around the domain, you same language. That's that's one uh, nice thing for me. So events are immutable, like you can't change them. But what happens if there's a bug in your code that publishes an, an event that like, can't be processed, and then, so you obviously can't track it, you publish an updated event later, but like, there's, in the interim, some other event 
So like if, if you're if there's a problem with your user registration event, mm -hmm. you put you know someone pro oh, yeah. pressable data in there, and then you have like that user wants to buy a player. Mm -hmm. you know, like if you can't process that user created mm -hmm. event, like how do you process yeah. that? Mm -hmm. that one? Yeah. So that's a situation that you need to fix. Maybe I would address as a county address. Mm -hmm. There is another action, and the maybe is a one-off action that only and it's not an action, it's not an event or a command that is part of my system, but it's part to fix my system. And it kind of like clearly tags, hey, this command was issued for fix, so it's not like an event that will be always present, but eventually will be used to fix things that didn't happen in a proper way. So the nice thing about that is you also then get like code audit as part of that too, versus like, Oh, I went to the, the Rails console and I just updated the record to reflect what it should be. You, you actually yeah. have to commit code and leave that code there yes. to show yep. how your state was built. Yeah, and there are systems that even the commands they are stored <coughs> somewhere <coughs> just for audit log. So there is no way for the system to be updated. Uh, and even the commands, the intents to modify the system are, re are recorded somewhere. <laughs> they are not used by the business logic, mm -hmm. but they are another layer of auditing because we want to see like why this command was issued many many times by who like you and you can import anything that you that you think is important like you say hey we should probably fix that and build it you know build it into your process and your software. Yeah. so i don't have that problem because i am a team of one i trust <laughs> myself but, but there are lots of uh that command recording is important. Any other question? How do you test this? Like it, it's like any other thing. Like you have, the unit test is pretty simple because as you have these components with very similar responsibility, it's super lightweight. Uh, integration test, is a little like if you want to test uh, eventually consistency from top to bottom, maybe it's a little, I wouldn't say painful, uh, it's just like let's say if I need to test the user registration, I, I take a command, put some valid data through the API, everything works fine. I just need to check if the projection is updated after the projection is changed and I can compare uh, so it, you need to do it action by action like in the full cycle but I have all the tests like it's just like you need to the only thing that is tricky is the eventually consistent piece because I need to wait for strong consistency in my test because if I don't have that I'm not sure if it really didn't happen because it will happen or it didn't happen because it failed. And I have like, oh, invalid command, a command with situation like a duplication of email, but a valid command twice, and see if there is no projection being updated twice. You can exercise all of that, and it's doable. It's just the eventually consistent testing that's the tricky piece. Uh, in practice, like when you're using your app, do you even notice like the eventual consistency, or is it? Yeah, fascinating? yeah. Sometimes the the registration when I use the register, I see the zero, and later I see the one hundred. Yeah, yeah. And that that's something that if it bothers me, I can make the API to wait for the projections that's there. If that bothers, if that bothers the, the user. But so I guess if it, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it, let's say that the user is super fast, he registered and tried to buy something, you'll be able to. But maybe it's not seen that he has money in his wallet. <laughs> so you have the option at the API layer to make anything strong feel secret. Yeah, yeah, you want. yeah. Mm -hmm. You just maybe it is a trade-off. Like you maybe is this really important to be like sync because you hold and maybe you hold more time than should ex should be uh, ideal. All right.